Welcome to another episode of On Target. I'm your host, Alex Elaine, and today we're joined by a very special guest as always. This time we've got Omri Chaznet, who's an accomplished sales leader with over a decade of experience driving revenue growth at some of the top software companies in the world. He's currently Vice President of Sales at Salesforce, where he's worked for the past eight years. And in his current role, he co-leads the UK healthcare and life sciences business. Prior to Salesforce, Omri held sales leadership positions at startups and larger enterprises alike, and he's got a proven track record of achieving revenue and business growth goals. But beyond the numbers, Omri is also known for his creativity, high energy and commitment to results, and he leverages his strong personal skills and sales expertise to communicate value and build trusted relationships with execs across multiple industries. Thrilled to have you here today, Omri, to discuss all things sales leadership and beyond. But before we dive in, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alex. And uh, wow, what an intro. I'm, I'm not sure I could uh, top that myself. I really, really appreciate that. <laughs> you don't do things in halves here. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Alex. You, you went all in. So uh, yeah, I appreciate that. And great to be here. Thanks uh, for hosting me on the show, Alex. It's a great pleasure. So Omri, you know, we've spoken a bit about some of your career to date, but no better person to bring that to life than yourself. So do you want to just talk to us a bit bit about your personal and professional journey up into where you are today? Yeah, I mean, the question is, how far do you want to go back? That's uh, that's the only uh, the only thing. Give us the summarized version, the two minute version. Okay, the two minute version is so um, I have to say, uh, yeah, a big chunk of my career is really Salesforce. Uh, and, you know, eight years is a pretty big number. And, 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 you know, in today's world, you don't really see a lot of people staying in the same company for such a long time. Uh, whereas I think Salesforce is a bit of a special case. We, we can touch on that later, why that is and, uh, um, and how that happens. Um, but, yeah, I think um, my career was always in tech. Uh, I wasn't always sure I wanted to be a salesperson. Actually, if you go far enough back, uh, I probably was thinking uh, probably negative things about salespeople. Uh, but uh, you know, ever since I started as a BDR, uh, calling cold calling into the U.S. market uh, from an office in Jerusalem uh, in 2010 or 2009 or something like that. Um, I, I came to realization actually, uh, yeah, maybe there is uh, something in it for me. So yeah, I started as a as a as most you know sales career starts uh, sales careers start uh, with a BDR job at a company that is trying to break into the U.S. market. It was an Israeli startup, um, and you know working uh, reverse hours, so starting my day at about six p.m. Uh, and ending sometime. Well, depending how successful the cold calling went but it could be any time uh usually after midnight uh and then from there uh i went into uh consulting so i was interviewing for this tiny little company that's trying to bring this really innovative product that nobody has heard of back then in 2012 or so uh which was called salesforce into the israeli market nobody knew what it was uh, it was that thing in the cloud. Nobody trusted the cloud. Uh, and then it was four years of really building a market from scratch. Uh, luckily, we, as a company, we bet on the on the on the right horse, and it went really well. Uh, and then successful selling there uh, ended up becoming uh, head of sales for that organization. Um, and then from there, the a natural progression for me was to move on from the professional services side of things, the consulting side of things, uh, and into uh, the company itself, uh, which was, you know, top place to work uh, in and one of the fastest growing companies uh, in the world at the time, if not the fastest tech company. So, uh, so yeah, that, that's really the story. And then in Salesforce itself, uh, pretty much did all the different sell jobs from uh, mid-market all the way up to uh, enterprise and strategic. Uh, and now uh, lucky enough to be a, a leader in that business as a regional vice president, like you said, managing the healthcare and life sciences part of the business. Wonderful. Quite quite the journey that you've had, Omri. So 
when we just talk a bit about your journey from being individual contributor into leadership, I'd, I'd love to know and just unpack a bit more about what that transition looked like. How did you best prepare yourself for it? And now that you're in the seat, what are some of the reflections that you have about how you could have maybe been even better prepared if you were back in that IC seat again? No, I think I think it's a it's a good question, and uh, it's a question that actually was on my mind as well a lot uh, at the time I was trying to make the the transition from an IC to a leader. Uh, I view it, and if there's anyone else listening now and thinking, "Oh, I'm trying to do it, and it's really tough," I think it's one of those pivotal points in your career where it's just really tough. And I think you get them uh, in many different stages of your career. Uh, and my advice is just work hard, try hard, don't give up. It is tough. Uh, and if you really want it, you will find a way to do it. So that's that's the first thing uh, I would advise to anyone. Uh, me personally, um, I think I knew that my my end goal was always to become a sales leader. Because when I was in IC, you know, I was looking up to not all of the sales leaders, unfortunately, but but many sales leaders. And I always knew this is what I want to be doing. Uh, this is my North Star. Um, so it was very easy for me to kind of, you know, aim my career and, and the way I do things to towards this, this end. Um, best piece of advice I can give... Uh, at some point in your career, you will be a very good salesperson and you will feel like it's now time to really focus on that transition. And at that point, uh, and this also the, obviously the advice I was given by uh, people who I was uh, trying to get hired by, you need to start thinking like a leader. You need to start showing uh, that you're behaving like a leader and you need to work on your, on your brand, this, this thing that uh, everybody say, not sure what it is, but it is also important. And you need to be top of mind. If you do all those things uh, and you do it for long enough and hard enough, sooner or later, you will make the jump. Makes a ton of sense, uh, Omri. Thanks a lot for sharing that. It's, um, it's always interesting when reflecting back on that transition. And I think about it myself. There's, uh, so many, there's so many ways that you can try to prepare yourself. But in a way, ultimately, it's only once you're really in the seat there's always going to be things that just catch you a bit from the uh, from the from the blind end of the spectrum that you only really learn once you're in in the role. That's one of the things I found. You know, read all of the books, had all of the mentors, but it, it was just different. You know, once you're in it and you're you're responsible for other lives, you've got other people coming to you with such a wide spectrum of different challenges um, and and uh, points of upside. Um, that's really where it, it does start to become a, a different ball game. So uh, always interesting when I hear people's perspective on, on that one. So where we're talking about, you know, this transition now, Omri, as mentioned, you're responsible for, for people within your team. So I want to talk a bit about just the coaching and the development of talent. Um, but before we get into that, let's start off why some of your methodologies for how you think about hiring talent you know what do you look out for what are some of the characteristics that stand out for you yeah um so obviously it's a very uh, big and complicated question because there's no silver bullet or 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 a you know one specific specific thing you need to look for um it, it's really about what type of of job needs to be done and i think the best leaders you know hire and put in place the right people for the right jobs, right? Um, so for example, if I'm hiring a BDR manager, uh, it needs to be a different type of person with a different type of maybe personality experience uh, than somebody who might need to manage a very seasoned, um, high-performing enterprise team that deals with uh, Fortune 500 companies. Um, so really, I think, your question, the first thing is, what is the job? What does the job require? And then uh, making sure you, you you put the right person in the right seat. Got it. Got it. Okay. I, I understand that. So 
if you were to, you know, interview 10 candidates, for example, and you wanted to, you know, find that, that gem, right? That diamond in the rough, if you want to call it that, what, what are the things that would impress Omri? You know, if someone's sitting across from the table from you right now, what would you want to see, hear and understand for you to say, this is the type of hire for me and my team? Yeah. So, um, I think, I think it's, it's many different things. Uh, if, if I wanted to just take one thing that is across all of the roles, I would say, um, somebody who cares, who's ambitious, who really wants to be successful, uh, because this is something that if someone doesn't have, it's very difficult, uh, for them to become a performer. And, and, you know, I, I was talking uh, whether it's a mid-market person or an SME person or an enterprise person, if they don't have it in them to be successful, to perform that mindset of uh, achievement, right? Uh, this is also not something you can coach. I think people have it within them. They need to want it. If they don't want it, uh, it, it it's really hard. And you can be, you know, you can be skills-wise, maybe not, the, the best, most polished salesperson on the planet. But, you know, if you have the passion, if you have the drive, uh, you will definitely get more results from a very, very polished individual who just doesn't add, have it in them to, uh, you know, to really work hard and, and, and not, not give up and, and, you know, try all angles to achieve the results, uh, think outside of the box, uh, you know, all those things come with this level of, 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 of grit and hard work and achievement that, that is within people. So I think when I, when I interview somebody for the first time to your question is I'm trying to assess, is this person for real? Is what I'm hearing now um, a bit of a facade? Is it, is it for shows? Or is this person really genuinely wanted? And I think to leaders listening, um, it's about your I guess, experience and, and, and emotional intelligence to understand whether the person is genuine or not. But you also ask questions to uncover it. And the, the questions are, the best questions are why? Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to be successful? What is your plan? What is, uh, why, why are you doing this to achieve what in the long term? And if, if you have that, then you will be able to, you know, there's no guarantee, obviously. Um, everyone makes a bit higher every now and then, but uh, this is really where, where, it, where it needs to come from in life. Got it. Okay. So now you found that person, you've hired them, they're in C. What are some of the core principles you have around talent development, right? What are some of the key pillars you lean on when it comes to developing your best people? Yeah. Um, so one thing I really like to emphasize uh, in teams that I lead um, when you think about the profession of sales, when you think about sales teams, right? Uh, and, you know, we've all been in different types of sales teams and there's different, uh, you know, type of, of, of people and, and there's different type of team culture and, and everything. Uh, I think one of the most important things for every sales leader is to build a team culture that is um, collaborative, Okay. Because very easily for a sales leader, uh, you could find yourself managing a bunch of mercenaries who have a one-to-one -one relationship with you, but doesn't or don't know anything about one another, right? And um, for me, developing an individual is not just my responsibility. It is my responsibility, but I think the best way to do it is also to make sure that there's collaboration with the peers. So if you have you know, six, eight, 10 people on the team, and they're not speaking to one another, then, you know, I think, I think it's a problem. I think it's the leader's responsibility to foster that culture, that team relationship to make sure that it's not just each and every one of them working towards their own personal goals, uh, but to set some kind of different team goals, to set knowledge shares, to make sure that they like one another, maybe building the team culture so that even when you're not there, you know, that they can ask one another and, you know, some of my top salespeople probably by now are better salespeople than I would be if I were in their seats, right? So, you know, sometimes um, 
you know, a new salesperson joining the team is, is much better off learning from the top performer rather than learning directly from me. Because, you know, last time I was doing sales was four years ago. So, um, you know, probably things changed. The, the tricks of the trade have developed. Um, there's, there's things that we sell today that didn't exist when I was a salesperson on the ground uh, three, four years ago. So, you know, I, I really like, you know, I'm expanding on this point because I think this is, in my success as well as a leader, I think this is one of the things that really made a difference. Uh, and if I also compare when I was an IC, uh, you know, the, the ties where the team was, was supporting one another, uh, I personally was more successful. I think as a result, everybody else were as well. Got it. Interesting. So this premise of culture, collaboration sounds like it's really important to you. So I just want to put you in the shoes of, let's say someone in a startup that is just greener in their nature versus, for example, where you are now, culture is probably much more embedded in the, the corporate structure just because of your size and your maturity as a company. But you've also worked for younger companies. So how does a, a leader in that type of position or even a leader in a larger enterprise that wants to create a unique team culture What's the first steps they could take to start building that culture and then foster that over time? Yeah. Uh, so it's a great question. And I think it transcends beyond um, enterprise or, um, you know, or, or startup culture because culture you can build uh, anywhere you are. Um, it really starts with what kind of team are you? So the definition of, of, you know, not just the, the A entity as, as the seller's entity as what is a good seller, right? Also ask yourself, what does a good team look like? Uh, you could involve your, um, uh, your team in it. We have done a sales training um, in the past that was all about, uh, you know, that they took the mentality of, of rowing teams, for example, right? Uh, and you can build like a team agreement between yourself and the team what are the rules and how do you work as a team? So, you know, there's many ways to do it. It's just, just, just one example. Um, but, but really it's about what is the, what, 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 what is the team about, right? What, what kind of team is it? Is it a team that, you know, refuses to lose? Is it a team that really likes one another and do a, uh, social engagement every Wednesday, uh, no one gets out. Is it a team that, uh, is really about uh, pushing a certain industry. So, you know, we're the healthcare and life sciences team. We're all passionate about this. Is this a team that is not just about selling individual deals? It's about raising the um, visibility and the, um, and the prominence of that industry inside of Salesforce, right? So it, it could be many things, right? It's, I think it's, it's, it's really about the leader to identify them and really put them front and center with the team and make sure they buy into that. So I, I think this this is really a, a key thing in my in my opinion. I, I I get I get exactly your angle. I'd also encourage people to other sales leaders to just consider their values and principles. I, I see that teams and companies and cultures are, are predicated and founded on um, a set of values, a set of principles. You know, when you look at Salesforce, you know, I used to work for AWS, you know, these companies have a very strong core set of leadership principles and holistic values. And that gives you the baseline to encourage other team members and others to really get behind that. So to anyone looking to, to move from a standing star, absolutely consider what principles do you have and, and how are you choosing to lean on those on a day-to-day -day basis? So absolutely. Omri, just moving into just really things around challenges that you often see sales leaders have and some of the ones that you may face day to day or week to week. I I'd love if you could just open up for some of the, the general challenges that you face being a sales leader and, and, and any mechanisms that you've started to implement to overcome them. Okay. Um, well, I think one challenge that I believe everyone's facing um, is where the economy is at, at the moment and how difficult it is becoming um, 
to close business just just generally right and i think customers are very uh cautious before they spend on pretty much anything and this is a challenge that really requires you to i think invest a lot more into every engagement and every customer interaction and be a lot more intentful and also sensitive uh, with with every customer engagement. And it's tough. It, it doesn't, you know, um, I think that was uh, one of the things that I think that when I lost my first deal or something like that years ago, somebody told me uh, putting the inputs in sales never guarantees the result. Uh, and it doesn't. But it could definitely uh, increase the probability of, of of that result. So I think you know there's it, it, there's no easy wins. Uh, there's no free meals. It's it's all very um, difficult right now. And uh, I think you know the the way really to 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 counter that is being really professional, really intentful, really organized as well uh, in how you go about your deals. Uh, doing the proper qualification using a sales methodology. So, you know, if it's, uh, um, if it's medic, uh, if it's any other sales methodology that, that an organization uses that really helps you uh, qualify, progress the deal, uh, ask questions all the time, constantly requalifying, asking questions over and over again, making sure that you're still relevant to what the customer wants, making sure that you know, that the budget expectations and the spending expectations are met, making sure that there is a real clear view for the business case, right? And it doesn't have to be a, you know, a number of business cases. It could just be, if you buy that thing, how does it help your business, right? Because I think the, the moment you lose sight of that, it's all back to what's the cheapest solution we can buy and, and that's it. So, you know, I think now more than ever, um, it's not just about the relationship. It's not just about, um, you know, having the, the best product in the market. It's also about really doing a tight process and, and, and not letting your guard down, uh, as, as you do it, do that. I think, um, it's, it's easier to overcome the challenge. And if you're, if you're a startup, uh, and you don't have a sales methodology, uh, make sure you get one and it's, it's, it's not difficult. Uh, there's lots of, different sales trainers and, uh, and people who can, you know, help you build your sales methodology. And, 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 you know, it, it's a matter of a few days and, and, and you can have one and just make sure you enforce it and you use it and you talk, you, know, you build a language, you talk to your salespeople, uh, you do your deal review all through that lens, uh, to really overcome those, those challenges we're having in the market right now. Mm, in, interesting. You, you obviously spoken about the tough market conditions and, a lot of what you work through would uh, just talk through would certainly be helpful to salespeople out on the field. I, I have my sales leader hat on right now. And I think to myself, what are the things I could or should be doing to keep my sales team motivated? Um, especially when things are harder, as you're saying, it sounds like, you know, you're talking through more work, more depth, more intent. How do, how do you drive those behaviors from your sales team when they may not be, uh, may not have as much time uh, in the field as you have to have weathered a lot of these storms before. Yeah, and um, you know, you you do need to find a balance. Um, so again, I'll I'll be annoying again, and I'll say it, it's situational, right? Um, there's no one size size fits all. Uh, it depends who are your salespeople, what their level of maturity, uh, and I think. Uh, this can determine really how much, uh, freedom versus, uh, um, you know, cadence and, uh, and guardrails that you need to put in as a leader. Uh, obviously the more mature they are, I think probably you're better off actually trusting them, letting them do what you trust that they can do, uh, set the expectations obviously up front and then set, you know, checkpoints here and there and make sure that everything is going to plan uh and you know make sure they know that they can come to you as much as they want obviously but uh, it, it's really about that i think the more challenging thing is when it comes to leaders who are leading a more junior sales team where 
they don't have that experience, they don't know, this is when you need to really start to do more and, you know, dig, dig a little bit deeper into, you know, how they manage their, their time, how they, uh, how they conduct their deals, maybe joining on calls uh, as, as a listener sometimes, uh, sometimes joining on calls, not just as the exact sponsor as, you know, as you do when, when there is maybe a, a deal and, and, and the AE is very experienced and they don't need you throughout the process. You can just come in the end and help close it. Uh, the level of maturity is lower. Obviously, you need to be a lot more hands-on and then, you know, different cadences. So a daily call, um, maybe a team huddle once, twice, three times a week as much as necessary. Um, and I think it's, you know, a subject that's uh, already been talked through a lot, but there's also like remote working versus uh, versus virtual, right? I think the more mature your team is, the more confident you can be that, you know, let them remote work as much as they want. You don't really need them close to you all the time because you don't need to monitor them all the time. Um, versus maybe a team that's very young and inexperienced where you, you probably, maybe not every day, but you probably want to make sure that they stay closer together uh, more often than not. You've opened up the can now, Omri, which is uh, the remote work versus in office debate. So it'd be, I'd be remiss not to get your perspective around how you feel about the rise of remote work and what your perspective is on whether you feel there is more effectiveness in the office versus being home-based. Yeah, well, um, I guess, uh, I guess my, my position is probably a little bit old school, but I'll, I'll start by saying, um, Remote work is not like a, a fashion trend where, you know, you wear some clothes and they look good now. And if you look for, at a picture from 20 years ago, you'll say, wow, that looks really silly. Uh, it's not that. I think remote work is more like uh, people had horses and now they have cars, right? So um, it, it really is, you know, something that is here to stay. It's, it's, it's not even a question. Um, and it, it, it does have a lot of efficiencies, right? You, you could, you could do a lot more with, with less time. Uh, you could talk to a lot more people in a, in a shorter amount of time. I think, you know, those advantages, uh, have been here for a while. You know, people start working, uh, talking about remote working, um, you know, after COVID, but, you know, I've been doing remote meetings ever since uh, my first day of, of selling in, in 2009, right? So, um, Yes, I did more face-to-face -face meetings, but it's not like we didn't go on conference calls and uh, go went on Cisco WebEx and dial those numbers. We we've all done that, right? You could remote work, you know, for 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 almost you know twenty years now. It's not, it's nothing new. Um, so I do think that it's here to stay. Now, if you're asking my personal opinion, I just love going to the office. <laughs> Call me old school. Uh, I'm probably a minority, uh, but you know, um, it's. It's just that the fact that you can wake up in the morning, get out of your house, um, spend time with people. They don't have to be your team. It's just like seeing people around you. Uh, switch the atmosphere to something else. Otherwise, it's just like you're staying in your house and you, 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 never, you never get out the whole, the whole day, um, especially if it's a busy time of work and you, know, you, you find you don't do much in the evenings as well. And then you just find yourself homebound until the weekend. So, um, you know, my, my, that, that's my personal uh, view on that. Uh, I think when we look at how it affects work, you know, it needs to be a hybrid model. That, that's the short answer. Um, you, you can't expect people to come to the office every day. That's, that's gone now. Uh, but you do need to make sure your, your sellers see your customers face to face because that makes a huge difference. Uh, and I think in, in any, any size deal, any relationship, seeing people face to face makes a difference. Uh, and I, I don't think anyone would argue with that. The other thing is, you know, going back to the beginning of our call and, and talking about build, building and fostering that team culture, uh, I don't think it's possible without meeting each other face to face, right? So, um, those are the two key points uh, I would I would I would stick to. Well, the the debate runs on, doesn't it? I I have to admit my perspective 
evolved over time. Probably where we have some similarities, I probably had quite a traditional stance on it because my career started that way. Uh, you know, printers and copiers, very hard. And I mean, not being in the office was just non-optional, right? You were you were out there uh, canvassing door to door. It was it was all of the above. So. I carry have carried a lot of that through my career as well, but like you've said, you know th- things have evolved and move on, and and certainly it's not going anywhere tomorrow. So the hybrid model does feel like the most sensible and and, and approachable model for most companies. I am still seeing some uh, go with more of an enforcement of the five days a week, and uh, but more and more seem to be adopting either hybrid or in some cases going remote first, which which is continuing to be on the rise. So an interesting one to continue to track over time, eh? Yeah, and 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 just just on that, you know, the enforcing in my view is just uh the balancing of the equation, right? So I think we went from in office, I think it was always hybrid, especially in the tech industry. Okay. If you're looking at other industries, then yes, it was in office, but Looking at tech, it was always, always, always remote in, for 20 years. Um, I think we went to full remote and then leadership teams and managers and, and everybody started really getting scared, especially when the economy started slowing down. They were looking for things to blame. And I think that was that was quite an easy thing to blame, right? What 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 changed? What did we do in the last X years, two, three years that we weren't doing before? Why, why, why have things dropped? And that that was an easy culprit, um, but the enforcement I think is also not a great thing to do because I think that creates uh, stress, tensions, uh, people leaving, so you know turnover. Uh, so you know I, I know people who got a job, their dream job, and they were told, "Oh, but you need to be in the office four days a week," and they're like, "Oh no, thank you." So you could also lose on some really good talent because of that. Um, I think long term it will just be you know went from one extreme to the other extreme to just meet somewhere in the middle um you know that that's my personal view yeah no most we we'll, we'll we'll see how it all pans out i I want to also get your perspective Omri, around you know you've spoken about how people can get stressed out from certain things and just prompted my mind you know as a sales leader to learn more about really your operating rhythm you know uh your your what you do personally to make sure that you do stay energized um, and to have enabled you to sustain such a long-standing, enduring career within sales. Um, you know, some people describe it as an athletic career, right? You get a short run, you make your money and, and you move on. Uh, but you, you're starting to rack up uh, some years, which is very impressive. But I'm sure some want to know what's been the key behind your longevity so far. Um, yeah, I... I, I... I genuinely think um, it, it's a personality thing. So I think for some people, um, stress is a negative thing. For me, it it makes me feel alive. You know, it's it's a bit like extreme sports. So if you're if you're asking me, would I would I bungee jump or would I? Uh, you know, uh, free dive with uh, what great white sharks. I probably wouldn't. Uh, I would probably say it's scary. But if you ask an extreme sports athlete, they'll say it fills me with adrenaline. I love it. It's the best feeling uh, in the world. Uh, so I, I would say, for me personally, I really enjoy when there's lots of action and things are happening and there's stress and it's Q4 and you got to do loads of things and you really fills me with excitement. Um, So I think for me personally, uh, I didn't feel like it was a challenge to keep it up, even when it was for prolonged uh, times. And always in sales careers, it's peaks. You know, sometimes you're really busy and there's like lots of excitement. And other time you find yourself just prospecting for a few months without any pipeline and it's really boring and bleak. And, um, you know, so it's not like you're you're always like that. also, when when it's bad, you can always remember what really what really gets you excited about the job. So remind myself, okay, so two months ago I was too busy. I've had loads of deals. I was really really busy with lots of stuff. So maybe enjoy the downtime. I think uh, 
from a from a leadership perspective, uh, somebody like me, uh, it's 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 a bit of a trap. And I think one of the challenges that I always had, and I think still have, is obviously the people who work for me aren't like that, right? Some of them uh, don't really uh, enjoy that level of stress uh, like I do, right? And uh, you know. It's really about the emotional intelligence to to know when uh, it's too much, when to really give them that that kind of slack or or whatever that they need at this point. You know, time off, uh, encouragement. You know, what 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 is it that will really help them at this point? Uh, because you know, managing stress levels is a very individual thing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a fascinating topic. The thing that you mentioned that I want to better understand is just how you look at and perceive and deal with stress because it was interesting when you're talking about the analogy with extreme athletes. But what I want to know with you is, did you foster that that mentality? Is that something that you had an event that happened and you said, I don't want to go through this again then you went on a journey to almost combat it? Or is this something that's just intrinsic in you from your upbringing? Because I'm sure others would love to know how to either cultivate that if they don't have that right now. Um, I think, I think it's, it's, it's mainly intrinsic uh, and it comes from me being uh, very task oriented. I think, as, as a person. So, you know, I... I see a goal and I want to achieve the goal and I I don't like quitting as well. I don't like losing. So I think it's, 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 it's a lot of that is really, um, uh, intrinsic. Yes. But I think everyone just needs to identify, you know, where their challenge is and, and, and like you said, build their journey to double down where they're strong. And then try to you you will never be the best at your weaknesses, right? Uh, I mean, you know, for the life of me, I can I can practice football for twenty thousand hours. I will still be a very mediocre football player, right? Uh, but at least I'll be mediocre, right? If 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 this is what 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 I need to, you know, to to work on my weakness. Um, so, for example, if if your weakness is is managing stress, for example, right, then. You know, you just want to make sure it's not something that's blocking you from being the best salesperson. Because it might, maybe you're an amazing salesperson, the best ever. Uh, but your challenge is, is that you just can't work enough to uh, sustain that, that performance that is required from you, right? So then, you know, my advice would be, you know, find what, what calms you down you know, manage your time in the right way, uh, meditate and, uh, you know, anything really to take, take maybe consultation about, you know, how to, how to, uh, build resilience and how to, so, um, I think everybody have their own journey. I think my, my personal journey, uh, when I went into leadership was, was actually just the opposite, right? So, you know, understanding that not everyone is, is, is built that way. Uh, and then setting the expectations to uh, multiply and not diminish the people who work for you, right? So, um, you know, you, you can just very easily steamroll people uh, if you're like that and they're not. And it's not, they're not good, they're just different, right? Mm. Um, so, you know, my journey was um, started as, as an individual contributor where, you know, sometimes I could find myself demanding a lot from my peers in order to close a deal. Right. Uh, and so, you know, that, that was a challenge because a lot of time, times my peers were uh, not as motivated as I, I was to, to get something done, to work as hard as I wanted to work. Right. Um, so, you know, I think in the, in the beginning as, as a young uh, individual contributor, I was, I was being angry. Why are they lazy? Why do they not want to, do they not want to close the deal? Why are they giving me such a hard time? Why are they pushing back so much? Right. And then, with time, you understand, actually, it's just that not, not everybody are, are the same as you. Um, so you start, okay, so how do we motivate them? What's important to them? How do we, uh, how do we 
show them what's in it for them if, if, if we work together? How do we get them excited about this? How do we give them autonomy and what they need in that deal cycle so that they feel important and they, they want to do their best? Um, so, you know, I think for me, the journey was almost the opposite uh, of how I kind of tone myself down um, and, 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 and allow people more, more room and more space to, to, to really be themselves. Uh, but still, you know, hold them accountable to the, the results that I expect. Make, makes a lot of sense. I've last couple of questions for you, Omri. One of them being, how important do you feel motivation is? Some people say, actually, motivation is less important. It's really about discipline, which is you just got to get what you've got to get done, regardless of how you feel. I'd love to get your perspective on the motivation versus discipline debate. Um, yeah, m my view is, um, motivation beats discipline, uh, every time. And I think it's pretty clear, like ev everybody would say that, uh, I think the problem is, um, you, you, you can be motivated sometime to do some things, but you can't be motivated all the time to do everything. Right. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's a little bit about, you know, uh, rocks, pebbles, sand, if you know that analogy, right? When you fill your, um, you know, if you have a bucket and you want to fill it, then you'll fill it with rocks and then pebbles. And then you put in the sand, which is like, you know, the, the thing that completely fills it up and there's, there's no more air anymore in the bucket. Right. So I'd say, uh, if somebody doesn't have motivation for the rocks, right. And let's say rocks of sales will be, I don't know, closing business, right. Uh, pushing for deals, uh, doing some level of pipe gen, um, you know, being successful, making their number. If, if there's no motivation there, they're either in the, in the wrong profession, in the wrong company, or, you know, they just need to take some time off and, and you know, think about uh, whether they want to do what they do, right? So in the pebbles, I think, you know, it's, again, it's some, some, some pebbles will be, you know, definitely require motivation. Uh, and then for the sand, I think it's just discipline. Uh, you know, very few people are motivated to uh, put their notes in the CRM, right? So that is more about discipline. So, you know, it, 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 it needs to be that really, and every company is different, every leader is different. You need to really identify what are the areas where if someone's not motivated to do those things, they shouldn't be here. Right. What are the areas where it's just about keeping that, you know, discipline, um, motion moving, you know, every week, every day, every month, and, and just just inspecting and making sure that, you know, it's it's the basic stuff that nobody likes to do, but it's expected and you have to do it because you have to do it. Uh, and this is where, you know, discipline comes in and, and um on discipline, it doesn't always have to be you have to do it because you have to do it and that's it. You know, there's, there's ways to create motivation to be disciplined, like uh, creating leaderboards and creating dashboards and creating fun competitions that all of a sudden turn uh, a very dull thing into a competition and then makes, makes people motivated by their, you know, competitive nature um, to do something. You know, one thing I love about doing a podcast, Omris, is the breadth of perspectives that you get and where you mention that you think, most people would say motivation. I, I am actually on the other end of the spectrum. So I, I feel that discipline is far more important than motivation because I, I do believe that regardless of how uh, one feels, when, when there is a job to get done, that's actually what can create a champion in someone. I even think this morning I was, I was just tired. I, I got up at 4.30. I knew I had training. Um, so I did some work. and. I did debate it actually in my mind. I was like, gym, no gym, but it was discipline. That meant I trained. It was like, today is a training day. There is like, I'm not motivated to train whatsoever, but it's a training day. So I'm training. So that that's where I uh, have a, an alternate perspective, which is why I say that in itself is great. And also when you mentioned the point around, if you did the 20,000 hours of football, that you would still be average because 
the way I look at something like that, Omri, is I'm like, if you've got the right mentorship and the right coaching, I believe anyone really has the propensity to grow if you're putting an extended amount of hours with the right mentorship going in the right direction. I agree that if you have a baseline of coaching level and you're doing 20,000 hours of the same thing at the same level, you, you can't improve, right? But it's like going from primary school to secondary to university, you grow, right? And so again, these things aren't right or wrongs. They're just what make the sales leadership community so fun. Um, on that note, sorry, go on. No, it's it's actually a really good point, Alex. I think it's 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 a, it's a value thing um, because I'm I'm a huge believer in talent, and I'm a huge believer in some things you're born with, and I'm a huge believer of uh, playing to one's strengths. I think everyone can be successful. Everyone can be um, great. Everyone can be um, world class. I just think some people just didn't find where they need to invest and where to be world class. Um, so my view is, um, yes, you, you can you can work really, really, really hard uh, and and improve and and become even good at something, right? But you will still not win the gold medal in you know gymnastics uh, because if you weren't born with 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 the right you know talents, the right um, you know the the right the right body, the right uh, coordination. Uh, and so, you know, I think I think it, it, the same goes for for career as well. Uh, it, it's it's much better to find the thing that you that you love, find the thing that you're good at, become world class in that thing, um, and then I, I think it makes your career a lot more enjoyable as well. And you know, look, just like you, um, I do make myself go to the gym uh, every uh, you know every week. Uh, I don't always enjoy it. I do feel better afterwards, yet I don't, uh, I'm not trying to be a boxer, if you know what I mean, right? But I, I do I do challenge myself to, you know, take leadership courses and, and in, in, improve my, my own abilities as a leader, as a sales leader, learning about sales, learning about technology, because this is where I'm trying to be world-class. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, it's not as specific as football or gymnastics or or or, or sports, uh, but I do think you you need to just find your strengths and 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 focus on them, and then just just make sure your weaknesses are not blockers. Well, Omri, I really appreciate you sharing your perspective. It's it's been fascinating. Have you enjoyed being on? Oh, very much so, Alex. Yeah, and like I said, thanks so much for uh, having me on the, on the podcast. It was a great pleasure. To anyone who's listening, we hope you've enjoyed this too. Please be sure to like, comment, share and subscribe. 